Are you here? Wonderful. So, Prof, uh, we can start the program uh, if you are ready. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we will uh, start the session. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, so today is our uh, virtual uh, webinar on distal femur uh, fractures, organized by the Bangalore Trauma Course, KOA and BOS. Uh, Prof. Justin is here. Uh, welcome, Prof. Uh, so it's been a honor for, give, for being given the opportunity to introduce uh, two eminent master orthopedic surgeons. So both of them have vast experience and immense knowledge in the specialty, and it is a, a challenge to talk about their achievements in the field of orthopedic surgery in the short uh, duration. I'll try my best to give a brief intro to our audience. Uh, firstly, I would like to introduce Dr. Uh, Professor Christian Pratik, who is a director, professor, division of orthopedics from the world's renowned institute, Hanover Medical uh, School, Germany. Uh, Professor Kretek graduated from uh, Ludwig uh, Maimalans University in 1980 and uh, pursued further studies and training from Hanover. So, uh, Professor is a recipient of numerous awards and scholarship, is an editor in various journals, to name a few, JBJS, Injury, Journal of uh, Orthopedic and uh, Journal of Trauma. He has more than 800 publications uh, to date. And uh, he has uh, devised various instruments which are uh, used in today's orthopedic uh, practice, and uh, he holds the patents for the same. Of late, he has done a lot of uh, work in the use of uh, computer navigation uh, and robotics in orthopedic surgery for bone defects and trauma. He is still continuing his research in minimally invasive surgery and joint transplantation, which could be the future. And our second uh, speaker is uh, Professor Christoph Jostin. He's a professor in orthopedic and uh, currently the director of uh, Leipzig University Hospital. So he graduated from uh, Salad, uh, Saarland University Hospital in 1979. He obtained uh, surgical training uh, from uh, Bergmanshill University Hospitals in Bosham. He held various uh, offices uh, in orthopedic associations uh, at Germany. He was a past uh, president of uh, German Society of Trauma Surgery in 2012, and President of uh, German uh, Spine Society in 2014, and President European Society for Trauma and Emergency Surgery in 2017. He has uh, numerous publication research to his credit. His special interest is in trauma, spine, and pelvis to injuries. I welcome uh, you both uh, professors to our webinar. Thank you for accepting our invitation. I'm sure our audience is going to be amazed with their advanced uh, work and concepts which are going to present in the uh, talks today and uh, apart from them we have uh, eminent faculties uh, from our country uh, first is dr professor rajiv naik who is a past president indian orthopedic association who will be moderating and uh, chairing this session and we have uh, dr uday kumar and dr rajendra kivi and dr ajit kumar who are senior uh, faculty from karnataka so professor uh, uh, krishan prakatek over to you Please uh, share your screen and start your first talk. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your kind invitation. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Um, and um, <clears throat> thank you very much for having us um, uh, to share with you some of our concepts and ideas about distal femur fracture. This has always been uh, one of my topic which interested uh, me very much. And um, as you see from oh, the- Professor, um, can you share your screen? Can you yeah. share your screen? Yes. Okay. Can you see my screen? Can Not yet. See? Okay. What's now? Can you see my screen? Yes, Prof. Okay. I think you have to do. Uh, full screen. Full screen, I got. Yeah. Yes. You can see me? Fantastic. Okay. 
So uh, thanks again uh, for having me. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to share with uh, you some of our thoughts and ideas on distal femur fracture. And like Christoph uh, Joosten, hello to Leipzig. Um, we have a little bit different training system. So we go out uh, on the helicopter with the rescue car to the emergency scene, bring in the patient and to manage our emergency rooms, <clears throat> which are um, uh, controlled by the orthopedic surgeons. And this gives us some uh, sort of different views and uh, possibilities to develop ideas for emergency care, and especially also for the distal femur, which are a very difficult uh, fracture usually. Um, uh, I, you gave me three tasks to, um, to do uh, in the first task. I would like to start giving a brief interview, uh, in the overview why we uh, think minimally invasive surgery especially in the distal femur is a good thing to do and what uh, um, benefit it has. <clears throat> and uh, second one, uh, sharing with you uh, with tips and tricks. And the third one is uh, complex cases uh, open for discussion. So uh, we will briefly have a look on history and development. Uh, have a look on the interesting pathomechanics. The bone perfusion is very important uh, for the distal femur as it is uh, for most fractures. And we will, uh, of course, discuss a variety of approach uh, options. <clears throat> there is no conflict of interest uh, with a variety of editorial tasks and national and international patents. Um, distal femoral fracture problems uh, are two groups of uh, patients. One is high energy. Uh, usually these are dashboard injuries and uh, it's worthwhile to look for concomitant injuries, not only at the knee level, but also on the femoral shaft and the proximal femur on the vertebral column <clears throat> and on the posterior wall of the acetabulum because as you see with, uh, with the cradle, the mechanical energy coming to the knee is transferred to the entire, through the entire chain of bone from the knee uh, to, to the posterior parts. The other special thing on the distal femur is that we are facing very thin soft tissue cover around the knee. So it's only a few millimeters between the dashboard and the uh, knee surface. So uh, this needs to be kept in mind uh, when we are dealing with high energy injuries and um, open injuries as well. Another problem is that the knee is uh, covered with a large area of uh, uh, cartilage. So it is uh, somehow tricky uh, to place uh, the implants uh, properly. And often we are facing conflicts uh, between the integrity of the cartilage and the ideal vector for the placement of uh, screw implants. And finally, we have a closer uh, look to the vascularity, which by itself is really good. It's a high perfused um, area, but we need to make sure that we do not iatrogenically uh, disturb uh, this blood uh, perfusion, which is so important for the fracture healing. I would like to uh, go back in <coughs> with you um, a couple of years. Plating of the distal femurs. This was a really risky injury 30 years ago. And um, we have seen large uh, rates of non-union and high rates uh, of uh, bone grafting. And uh, you could uh, decrease the rate of non-union, but uh, for the sake of a high rate of uh, bone grafts. <clears throat> and um, this is very different, for example, to iron nailing of the femoral shaft, where we know fracture healing is a very well predictable. There is a very low non-union rate and uh, uh, bone graft, the need for bone graft is almost uh, zero. So this um, <clears throat> raises the question, 
what is the difference? Why is, uh, are these two fractures uh, uh, reacting so different to trauma and stabilization? And when we have uh, say, a look on this clinical example, which refractured uh, one month after implant removal, uh, two years after the trauma, um, this is uh, hard to understand because metaphysical bone uh, usually heals very, very uh, good and very, very fast, uh, like on the ankle or on the wrist or on the proximal humerus, all these locations show uh, um, very low non-union rates. <clears throat> And when we look on the perfusion of the distal femur, it seems to be well perfused and we don't understand why we needed so high rates of bone grafts in the past. And um, when we look on our techniques we used in the past, maybe it has something to do with uh, the blood supply. Um, distal femoral fractures in the history were approached with a lateral approach. So the uh, approach went through the fracture, fracture site. Uh, reduction was done directly and anatomically. And um, we had uh, <coughs> some visibility at the level of the shaft and the distal shaft, uh, <coughs> but uh, we had no good uh, visibility of the knee joint, which uh, we would love to address uh, uh, when we have uh, intra-articular fractures. And in order to approach this, we had, by definition, we had to ligate the perforator vessels and the soft tissues were automatically disrupted. Very different to, for example, what we do when we fix intramedullary uh, the femoral shaft. The approach is far away from the fracture site. Uh, the femoral reduction is done indirectly and non-anatomically. We don't care about the a uh, tiny position of the fragments, just the overall gross alignment is important. And finally, and this seems to be something very important, fracture soft tissue remain intact uh, during the entire stabilization. And in distal femur fractures, we have this permanent ongoing conflict uh, that we either can focus on good joint visibility with this approach or uh, <clears throat> we have a problem with uh, soft uh, tissue damage and uh, whatever we do, uh, we have uh, a problem on uh, the other side. So we can focus on soft tissue preservation like here, but then we have uh, at the same time, very limited visualization. And the question is, how can we solve this conflict? How can we get out of this uh, trap? And uh, that's uh, why we developed this new approach uh, to the knee, uh, the so-called TARPO approach, trains articular approach and retrograde plate osteosynthesis. Very simple to do, lateral part palate, patella arthrotomy. Patella is retracted medially, so it's important that we go underneath the skin um, between the rectus and the vastus lateralis. Uh, far proximal enough. And then we have fantastic exposure to the entire articular surface without any need for blood supply disruption. And so once we have uh, reconstructed uh, the femoral condyles and repaired the articular surface, we can then fix this articular block um, to the uh, femoral shaft with a retrogradely inserted uh, plate and uh, which is then fixed um, to the articular block and uh, the proximal uh, femoral shaft. So this uh, TARPO approach uh, helped us uh, to address these fractures like in this polytrauma case, uh, close 33, 3C, uh, C3 fractures with uh, initial damage control, temporary bridging with the external uh, fixator. And after a few days, we got back, uh, <clears throat> did the TARPO approach, the soft tissue uh, uh, envelope above the fracture zone. This is, contains all the good blood perfusion. This remained intact. The patella is reflected medially, which gives us fantastic exposure and fantastic possibilities to address even the 
post-remedial uh, articular parts, which are otherwise uh, with a standard lateral approach, very difficult uh, to reach. So uh, this uh, are the step re re repair and reconstruction of the articular block. And once this is achieved, uh, fixation of this block uh, with a retrograde inserted uh, plate uh, component, which is then fixed uh, to, the, uh, arti to the articular blo block and percutaneously uh, uh, to uh, the femoral uh, shaft. And look, here a four months uh, X-ray how nature thanks us for the preservation of the soft tissue. There is no primary and no secondary uh, bone graft and uh, the uh, <coughs> um, regenerative power of nature uh, fills the defect and bridges uh, uh, on the medial side uh, and uh, uh, leads to good fracture union. Here, the bilateral fractures, so the other side was uh, uh, fixed with um, minimal invasive techniques, but with a different uh, approach uh, as well. Good alignment, good leg length, uh, good range of motion uh, in this patient who had uh, uh, other severe injuries, as you can see uh, from the X, uh, uh, X ray. This has uh, been published uh, in a, a, a couple of uh, journals. Um, there are other approaches like the swash buckler approach to the distal femur, which also, um, uh, um, which in addition to our approach, uh, takes the vastus lateralis and uh, an entire flap is moved to the medial side. This also, uh, and I see this as a disadvantage, it requires uh, to uh, like it some of the perforator vessels, uh, which might be a problem. The question is if extra, if we have extra articular fracture. So why should we then need an arthrotomy if there is nothing uh, to repair? So this uh, from our view uh, requires a different approach, a concept. We do not need an arthrotomy. Therefore, we can be very minimally invasive just by uh, uh, <clears throat> a short step type of incision on the lateral side, exactly projected to the center of the uh, of the axis of the femoral shaft, and then um, uh, the implant is inserted retrogradely beneath the vastus lateralis muscles and uh, with some techniques and tricks we will uh, see in the second part of the presentation, uh, we will achieve not only safe um, and reliable fixation, but also can avoid uh, malalignment. <clears throat> So here's a post-operative course of this specific case, a small incision, long plate, and post-operative uh, routine um, CT uh, scan control in order to, uh, to rule out and check if there is no malalignment, which has been proven here is successfully. And uh, we did some experimental studies in order to learn, in order to find out why are these uh, new approaches uh, so different? Why is fracture healing so predictable and uncomplicated? And we found out with some silicon dye study in fresh post-mortem cadavers uh, to the femoral artery, we found uh, with the two different approach concepts, with the minimal invasive approach versus the conventional direct lateral approach, which also includes uh, the ligation of the perforator vessels, we had significant differences between the two groups in terms of periosteal and endosteal perfusion, as we can see easily from these uh, two radiographs. We see a network of uh, stained uh, uh, periosteal vessels, which is uh, almost zero in the control group. So uh, did this have impact on the clinical results? Yes, it did. Uh, with, the, with this study, we, <clears throat> we showed that with the uh, MIPO, we had significant uh, better healing compared to the standard lateral approach group. 
we had no primary and no secondary bone graft and we had 0% non-union and uh, no refractures, but um, we had more malrotation and um, this is, uh, and more valgus varus deformities compared to the standard incision group. And this is something we uh, later on focused on techniques. We modified techniques in order to avoid uh, these uh, uh, new problems. So um, implants were designed, and you have seen this uh, were implants um, which not were before the area of uh, locking plates. The implant have changed, uh, and at, in the 90s we met uh, uh, the phase of the locking plate, and uh, they were nicely, uh, which uh, locking plate, which were, uh, go back to Stefan Perrin and Robbie Frick, uh, they have developed this locked plate concept, which also respected blood perfusion more. This was then combined with the, uh, with the minimal invasive um, uh, philosophy with the MIPO philosophy and uh, adapted tools, handles, specific screws, uh, ending up in a less invasive stabilization, stabilization system, which has successfully entered and conquered as the orthopedic world. Of course, new instruments for new techniques and for new conditions were necessary, like these uh, specific uh, collinear bone clamps in order to avoid soft tissue uh, disruption uh, much more. Very successfully uh, has, uh, these, have these techniques been distributed around the world and uh, Nowadays, uh, almost every center is uh, doing these uh, distal femoral fractures uh, with non-invasive uh, either TARPO or uh, MIPO approaches uh, to the distal uh, femur. There are uh, additional tools came up uh, like computer navigation in order to help with uh, implant placement and uh, reduction uh, problems, but uh, from my point of view, still these techniques are not yet so solid and reliable as we would like to have them. And I think the producers uh, and companies still have uh, a long way to go in order to make them not only booth proof. Uh, when you see this demonstration on the industrial booth, everything works fine. But when it gets to the operating theater, sometimes this is very diff different because of mainly of uh, soft tissue uh, deformation of the um, reference basis. And uh, of course, with uh, new um, techniques, with closed techniques, we still need to control. So improved techniques, uh, improved imaging uh, techniques intraoperatively are needed in the future uh, in order to get better and better control for the management of these uh, injuries and uh, maybe one day we have more intelligent implants than st uh, just static uh, implants as we have uh, today. So let me summarize minimal invasive surgery in the distal femur still evolving, evolving. more data needed uh, in regards to outcomes, costs uh, and um, <clears throat> Unfortunately, we cannot measure invasivity. Articulate visualization, I hope I could bring it over, is really crucial for articular uh, um, management, uh, fracture management. Uh, still today, radiation exposure is increasing. There is a higher risk of malalignment and uh, new navigation and implant concepts are needed in order to get further improvement. Thank you very much for your attention. You can talk. Yeah. Good evening, uh, Dr. Kratek. This is Dr. Rajiv Naik. Hi. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, hello, Professor Justin. Good evening, too. Yes. Uh, Dr. Ajit, good evening. Good evening, sir. Yes. Uh, there has been a question from the audience to Professor Kretek. Sir, they would like to know what is new about your uh, published approach. 
Arpo. Hello. Hello. Yeah, Professor Kretek, can you hear us? Yes. There is a question from the audience. They would like you to describe your new approach in a little bit more detail. Okay. Um, as, uh, it's uh, uh, an approach from the front and uh, the approach to the articular surface is uh, with a parapatella approach. We do the subcutaneous incisions, the deep incision between the rectus muscle muscle and uh, cervastus lateralis and not uh, just uh, one or two centimeters. I try to go eight or 10 centimeters up in order to give the patella mobility to be reflected to the medial side. That is really the key that uh, we, we release the patella to the medial side still leave all the soft tissue of the supra, uh, supracondylar pouch, the soft tissue pouch on the fracture as good as we can. Uh, but it is important to get uh, this split between the vastus lateralis and uh, yes. the rectus muscle. Uh, how, how long is your incision, sir? Um, the skin incision is about 15 uh, or 20 centimeters. But important is that we have beneath uh, a, a good mobility and still keeps the supracondylar soft tissue pouch on the fracture fragments. Okay. What is it? Yeah, there is another question from the audience. Just hold on. Hold off, Role of minimum in invasive surgery in osteoporotic distal femur fractures in elderly. Uh, role of there is a question from the audience. Role of MEPO in osteoporotic fractures in the elderly. Yeah, I think uh, is uh, also for the elderly patient population, it is very important to respect the soft tissue, despite the fact it is often more difficult because the, the periosteum gets thinner and thinner and it's easily pulled off, stripped off uh, the femoral shaft. In addition to the soft tissue problems, we have another problem that we are facing pull out problems. Uh, we know that the locking screws have fantastic mechanical properties in term of shear resistance, but they are very poor in terms of pullout because the thread is only indented uh, mini, uh, very, very, very limited. So in, in the next uh, session, I will show our technique uh, where we are combining uh, circlage wires and screw, uh, locking screws together in order to have good pull-out resistant and good uh, shear resistant. Okay, good. Uh, do you do the surgeries on plane table or on traction table? All, all on plane table, radiolucent table. Um, I make sure I can uh, flex the knee uh, uh, by letting it hang off the table uh, on the uh, fractured side a bit so I can flex it and uh, but it's very important that you have un, undisturbed uh, radiographic uh, control and we are placing the contralateral side on an obstetric leg holder. This keeps the contralateral leg out of the way and we have a very good lateral uh, um, CRM exposure. Positive uh, CRM exposure. Yes. Uh, one more question. Do you consider cement augmentation for screws in osteoporotic fractures? Yes, that's an, uh, a part of the armamentarium. We don't use it very much, but I think it's, it's, it's part uh, of, uh, of, of the concept in desperate cases, not, but not as a routine.
Professor Jostin is shaking his head. But, uh, uh, yes, dear Christian, I, I, I share your, your doubts about uh, cement augmentation because uh, to place the cement correctly, you have to make sometimes a more old procedure. It's not so easy uh, to put in the cement in a thin corticalis structure. And then sometimes you destroy the thin corticalis by, implant, by introducing the cement with any syringe. So I agree completely with Christian Kretek that it's a very seldom procedure uh, to augment our screws uh, in the minimally invasive procedures by, by sensor. I hope you agree, Christian. Yes. Uh, Rajiv, Rajiv. Maybe we... Uh, Rajiv? Yes, what? Should uh, it, 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 how frequently then we need to remove those implants? How problematic it will be? A uh, very good question. Um, it depends a, a bit on the, um, on the patient and how is the patient coping with, with the implant. And I, my observation is mm, as a plate very easily gets too far anterior and patients don't like it because every knee flexion is a, is a soft tissue envelope is scrapping around uh, the plate. Uh, while when it is uh, a little bit more posterior and I will show it in my next uh, presentation, how we control this. Uh, then uh, this is um, tolerated much better. But there are symptoms with the patients not uh, maybe in 30-40% of the patients uh, we are um, patients is coming and complaining about um, blend problems. Yeah. Uh. Okay, Professor Kretek, we have some more questions. We will take them as we go along. So we go to the next case now. Is that all right, sir? Yes, for sure. Yeah. This discussion. Uh, Dr. Wuday, can you go ahead with your case, please? Yeah. Yeah. Are we putting it? Can you see my presentation? Yes, sir. We can see. You can go ahead. Yeah, you can see. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Kretek, for a wonderful exposition of your pathophysiology and uh, the various techniques. This is just a small case from which uh, we did about this case about 10 years ago. And we would like to know what are the experiences, what we would do in this case today. Yeah, in 2010, an 18-year-old male had a road traffic accident due to a motorbike accident and came to the casualty immediately. This was the injury, a compound fracture of the distal uh, thigh with the medial bone projecting out. And luckily he had no neurovascular deficit. Now this was the X-ray at that time, a grade three, three. This was the AP view and this is the lateral view. Now, the, Superior pole of the petala fracture in this area. Okay. Now, the patient was immediately taken up for surgery. He underwent a thorough debridement, a lateral lock compression plate fixation, and wiring of the petala. I would like your opinion about whether this fixation is right whether anything else could have been done. This was done in 2010. Professor Kretek? Uh, uh, okay, um, uh, thank you very much. But um, the problem is, is that the most important things uh, for judgment you can't see on the X-ray. It is how, how are the soft tissues or is the soft tissue handling? 
but uh, from from the X-ray, um, there is a plate. It seems to be uh, aligned, <clears throat> um, intraarticular uh, uh, lag screws. Um, it is hard to judge um, if you want to have a perfect control. Uh, you, you probably would need. A CT scan, but overall um, it seems aligned. Uh, and um, it's hard to predict how, how the outcome is because the most uh, uh, determining factors, uh, soft tissue management, washout, uh, are not readable by a CC image. And um, Professor Justin? Yes, um, I completely agree with uh, uh, Professor Critic's opinion. So it, at the first glance, it looks not so bad. So as okay. its alignment is okay, there is a, no under or, or retroconversion of the distal femur, but nevertheless looking of the clams, this has been an open procedure. Uh, there must yes. be a soft tissue damaging additional to the damage which has occurred at the trauma scene. So I believe uh, in, in some weeks, we will have a plate breakage uh, just where we have the leg screw. Uh, this is my opinion. Uh, so we, we will see what has happened, but my opinion is there will be a break, play, uh, plate breakage at the uh, level of the leg screw. Uh, Professor Justin, would you do this any differently? Would you, this was yeah. done about 10 years ago. Yes, no, no, would of, you, like yes. This I, today, would you do so, it differently? So I don't criticize it uh, 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 deeply no, no, because it has been 10 years ago. In, sorry? The moment you say the plate will break, yes. would, you, would you do this differently? Yes. Uh, in India 10 years ago, this has been a good standard. And this hasn't been a good standard 20 years ago in, in, in Germany. So. In this case, I, I would have made a more uh, um, MIPO technique that means not using a leg screw, make it much more uh, uh, longer uh, plate and yes. don't touch the fracture area as Christian Kretik showed it in his excellent first presentation uh, from his ideas and his philosophy concerning MIPO. That I would have done 10 years ago, that I would do also today. Any medial stabilization, sir? No, not any additional stabilization. I will talk about this later. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Can I proceed? Yeah, proceed with it. Right. This was around two months uh, post-operative. All doing fine so far. And then, then the next. This is at four months. Post-operative, we complains of pain. And as described by Professor Justin, there is a bending of the plate, probably a plate breakage is going into varus and even a flexion deformity. Varus, varus. Yes, sir. Now, what are your thoughts, sir? This is at six months post-op. He has a broken plate. He has a virus deformity. And at this point, there is no evidence of any infection. Mm. No, no evidence of any infection. Yes, Professor Justin. So it, it has occurred how I has predicted. But why you yeah. did wait two additional months after you have seen, after four months, that there is a break of the plate, is there a reason that you did wait? Did you hope that would be the secondary healing? My question to you. No, as you said, maybe we may. Some callus was forming here medially, so probably we waited a little longer. That's all. Probably today you will not wait for another two months. Wait for the plate to break. Rather, we were sitting and praying for it to heal. <laughs> <laughs> so what can we do now <laughs> or as you suggested today we would put a longer plate and would you prefer a medial plate 
Do you, any comments on the proximal uh, multiple screws used, sir? So many screws? The question is to whom? Sir, Professor Justin, sir, yours, sir. Yes, so um, if you ask me uh, the opinion today, there may be also some a vascular necrosis, as Christian Kretik showed it, there is a lack of biology and there are many options now you can do. Uh, so we don't see the, the soft tissue at the moment, which is very decisive. But uh, believing that the soft tissue has recovered, we have to remove the plate. And if yes. there's a psoriatrosis, and my philosophy of a, a treating of psoriatrosis, leaving a biologic osteosynthesis go in a stable osteosynthesis with additional cancellous bone on the medial side. This, I, I don't know how old this is in patient, a young patient, 18 or 20 years. Young Eight, patient, yeah, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18 years, years old. So I would go in, a, in, a, in, a, in this case in a new plate, correct the virus and make an additional uh, a, a medial uh, um, uh, cancellous bone. Bone graft. This, this would probably be my first choice. Professor Kret. Um, uh, our approach would be um, to revise it, um, to resect uh, the non union uh, uh, tissue, uh, accept uh, some shortening, and do classic two part uh, compression uh, fixation with a tensioning device, making sure that there is no no virus at all and uh, this um, would would be the key uh, the key aspects um, and um, probably take some bone grafts as well we would not make a medial uh, uh, medial approach at this stage um, no medial plate at this stage but keeping resecting the non-union, making sure alignment is good and doing a compression with uh, bone graft. What would be the implant of choice here, sir? I think there's nothing wrong with the implant. Uh, we probably would uh, take the same implant or a straight 4.5 millimeter uh, uh, LCDCP. Um, uh, uh, we would use uh, the plate tensioning device. The old Muller's clamps? Sorry? Old Muller's tensioning devices, sir. We used to use for... Yes, yes. Okay. Can I proceed? Sir, one minute. Will the, yeah, medial, sir, will the medial plate spoil the vascularity? So you object to it? Um, it's a question to me. Um, I, I, so I don't think it's necessary. We would uh, disrupt uh, soft tissues. It's an, uh, it's an, um, an approach which uh, the higher it goes, the more in inconvenient it gets. Um, so this is uh, we, we, uh, I just think it's not necessary. Ajit, uh, how would you tackle this in your institution? I mean, uh, like Professor said, we need to resect the non-union site. And uh, quite often when you do that, there'll be a huge gap there. And I think uh, we need to... Um, shortening is a good idea, but uh, some patients may not like the idea. So you, you need to have adequate bone graft and uh, compression plating. Okay, proceed with it. Okay. Anyway, he agreed for the resurgery. He underwent a plate removal. He underwent uh, replating with a longer plate. And we had to resect the non union site. We also underwent a closed lateral wedge osteotomy where we could correct the virus and the flexion deformity and underwent a bone grafting, cancellous bone grafting on the medial side. May I just comment here? Yeah, yes. Yeah, I mean, the bone at the original fracture site looks very dense. And I think this is what Professor was saying about resecting this, this. the non-union site. 
this one right this area the entire uh, this uh, this whole area looks very very dense yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so maybe uh, so there was more resection should have been done yeah i would have been tempted to resect the dense sclerotic bone um, yeah. get in much more bone graft and then yeah. compression plating yeah Um, I, don't know, I don't know what Professor uh, Justin will say. Uh, no, uh, my friend Ajit Kumar, yeah, I, I can understand your philosophy, but again, uh, to resect too much in this 18-year-old boy. Yeah. So I, I, yeah. I agree that there is a certain sclerotic uh, image, but there is also the potential of recovery of a young yeah. bone. So I agree with this procedure, uh, though I, I would agree. Also, I'm also not sure whether this, this bone would be by vital, but this could be seen during the operation. If you make a yeah, close sure. wedge osteotomy, and if you make the close wedge very, very precisely, not too, too, too fast, and you see whether the bone is blood supplied. And if the bone is blood supplied, so I would trust in this, and I would say this is is okay. I would accept this osteosynthesis and also this procedure. Professor Kretek, any comments? Yeah, um, uh, uh, in terms of bone grafting, mm, mm, uh, my access to, to bone graft would be I would use um, uh, part of the bone graft while the osteo after the osteotomy. And then I would go in with a laminar spreader, uh, slightly opening it, and then insert the first portion of, of, of cancellous bone through the osteotomy okay. to the medial side. Because once you have closed the osteotomy gap, you don't uh, reach yeah, yeah, yeah. the target area anymore without further compromise of soft tissue. So in the fracture side, to increase the vascularity, is it wise to drill some holes there? Yeah, um, uh, um, I would look like uh, Christian Austin said, I look on the uh, uh, resection sites. And if there would be doubt of uh, perfusion, I would, uh, I would resect more and um, also perforate these uh, sclerotic sounds with uh, this Okay, will they proceed? Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was around six months post-operative. And then, uh, because he was a nice young person, went on to heal very nicely. He developed uh, a full range of mobility. And that was his uh, post-op picture. And he did very well. Oh. If, if Excellent you, case. Thank you. Professor Kritak and Professor Justin, if you were to do this case today, would you put a long plate, minimally invasive, so please, sometimes yeah. old philosophies and old uh, operation, operation procedures are still worth to be done today. So we should not be too, uh, uh, too heavy in using any new methods. So probably I wouldn't do anything else, especially in the second uh, operation you have done. I would please, I would do this today the same. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thanks. We go to the... Yeah, uh, I'll just stop sharing, sir. I'll stop sharing. Then Professor Kretek can go on. Professor Kretek, you please take over for your next talk. Okay. Just give me a second to pull it out. Can we take some questions? Any people? Dual plating will come. It will come. Professor Justin, you lost some hairs, sir. Huh? Sorry? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, I lost some hairs, but not yes. my strength and my vitality. So. <laughs> <laughs> Do I need to push any button regarding? You can see my screen? Not yes. yet, sir. Not yet. Uh, I will have screen. also some problems to get my screen laid down. I don't know how to do it. No. Uh, we, will, we will guide you, sir. Thank you, Rajiv. 
What is Bangalore doing? Is Bangalore yeah. fine? No, no, he's doing well, sir. Perfectly all right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We are, our uh, our COVID has come down significantly, so we are very happy about that. It's too hot in Bangalore for COVID. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Full sir. screen. Yes, sir. We need to go on full screen, I think. Go ahead, sir. So, um, um, we have uh, heard that uh, minimal invasive techniques uh, are beneficial. Uh, potentially beneficial for fracture healing and avoidance of bone graft, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we buy at the same time uh, the risk of uh, having more deformity, and this not only means uh, virus uh, frontal plane deformity, but also torsional deformity, which are uh, uh, frequently underestimated. So, uh, in the next. Um, <clears throat> 10 or 15 minutes, I, I would like to focus on techniques and tips and tricks uh, uh, regarding the approach, the use of shant screws, the use of destructor. Um, I will describe how we, uh, um, how we do placing the plate uh, so that it is uh, properly seated, especially at the joint level to avoid this friction uh, after uh, surgery and, and these inconveniences. Uh, the use of mini plates for reduction, very helpful, uh, a very interesting new concept. The use of circlage wires combination with uh, locking screws, projection problems in, in the theater and alignment check in order to avoid frontal plane, sagittal plane and horizontal plane malalignment and uh, Finally, also the use of polar screws in case of intramedullary fixation. Um, um, we have been focusing on plate fixation, but I think it's worthwhile mentioning that um, <clears throat> uh, retrograde nailing is, uh, is, a, is a very good minimally invasive technique as well and uh, should have its place uh, in the armamentarium of the management of these uh, fractures. Again, no conflicts of interest uh, regarding uh, a couple of paid editorial tasks. Again, <clears throat> how to access? We have discussed uh, the, oops, we have discussed uh, the uh, options for the TARPO approach. Again, here is the uh, rectus muscles, here's the vastus lateralis, and we go beneath the rectus and the vastus lateralis in about eight centimeters uh, uh, above the patella uh, upper, surf, uh, upper edge in, in order to make uh, it possible to reflect the patella uh, to, to the uh, medial side. <clears throat> we are using this approach for the, uh, for the uh, C1 to C3 fractures and also for the B1 and B2 fractures as, as well. But when it's going to extra articular, we are um, coming really from the lateral side in projection and we check it with the image intensifier uh, from uh, perfectly in projection to the longitudinal axis of, um, of the shaft. And I see sometimes uh, with my assistants that say uh, trying to do some compromise, some a little bit lateral, but a little bit anterior and this, as this just uh, does not work. Um, we have to have clear, two, two different uh, clear uh, approach concepts uh, for the specific uh, fractures. For the extra articular uh, uh, fractures, it's a, it's a straight lateral approach and you can't reach the, this articular surface properly. Uh, tip number two, shine screws. Um, uh, many people use shine screws, but they use many people use only one shine screw. And um, I, uh, I would like to, to share with you our ideas for using two shine screws because one shine screw is uh, very good for tilting. You have good tilting control, but when it comes to fine rotation, you can't rotate a fragment with the help of the uh, 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 shine screw because it um, uh, uh, has no good. Uh, grip resistance um, in this direction. So we use two shine screws in an angle of 45 degree 
and with these two chain screws, one is here, one is here, we have like a bicycle riding uh, grip. We have full control in, 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 in two dimensions and this gives us a much better uh, uh, detail control to fine rotate the fragment into, onto the other fragment. You see here uh, retractors, you see a hook and you see that's the pouch, the supracondylar perfusion pouch. This stays completely intact and this is so beneficial for the fracture healing because all the perfusion comes from uh, this, uh, uh, this perfusion uh, pouch. Tip number three, large distractor. And um, uh, uh, Retro Pops that very nicely describes the use of the distractor. And his trick is to use a large distractor through the, so please forgive me, the so-called A-hole of the, of the locking plate. Uh, this allows uh, still knee flexion and extension, but at the same time fracture reduction with the help of the distractor, uh, pulling, pull, pulling it longitudinal. And um, <clears throat> this is very effective uh, for longitudinal pull, minimizing cutout control of length, you still can play with rotation and uh, frontal and sagittal plane manipulation because this uh, distractor is uh, not, uh, not rigid. And here, uh, one pin uh, above and one pin in the plate, it gives a very good control to the entire reduction construct until you have your final position. Plate number four and... Uh, uh, create a fence. Uh, we create a fence um, um, against the uh, gross movement of the plate, but still uh, allows you to fine tune the plate position. If the plate is tending to slip very easily too far anterior, but then the patient have post-operatively this, uh, this um, implant related to pain during knee flexion. We want on one side as a plate going uh, far enough distal, but not too far. So we create this sort of fence, still allowing us to plate with, uh, with, um, with the other dimensions uh, in order to get uh, a good uh, plate uh, fixation and reduction. The shaft component, we also uh, create a fence with two K-bars, one anterior, one posterior still allowing us to uh, play with links, with rotation and uh, frontal sagittal uh, plane until we finally fix it definitively. Um, sometimes we have a very low uh, complex extra articular fracture patterns. And uh, especially uh, if we, when we have these long oblique fracture lines with only very limited contact. Sometimes you have only a few millimeters contact, which identif identifies your contact zone because other, all the other stuff is crushed out. Uh, but uh, from a fracture pattern, you are able to identify a small part. We use these small mini fragments to link these two main fragments together, uh, just as a temporary thing which gives you some reduced mobility, but still able, you are able to, to flex uh, in the frontal plane in order to fine tune frontal plane alignment. Uh, so you still can uh, uh, play around, but it's not as fine, uh, as mobile as it is uh, without. Usually small wire fixation are, are not uh, working because the contact is just uh, too small. Uh, in these instances, um, these uh, small mini, temporary mini plates are very helpful for this situation. Here is such a clinical case, very low fracture, very co uh, compromised articular surface, very low 15 millimeter in the, in the central part uh, of articular uh, construct uh, shortened because it's heavily contaminated uh, uh, femoral shaft. So this is something which is highly unstable and small plates uh, <clears throat> help uh, for temporary fixation. And this is also a case where medial plating 
is absolutely help, helpful in order to make sure the construct um, uh, has a, a proper uh, stability to keep the alignment. And here we see the uh, healing of the case. Um, uh, so medial support in highly unstable situation is, uh, is helpful. And here the post-operative situations we shortened, uh, but then later secondarily uh, lengthened the patient in order to get him uh, back uh, to uh, his original length. Uh, another tip uh, is um, to use a circular joie, either as a reduction aid. Uh, and with these uh, two part uh, properties, uh, circlage and feeder, you can easily uh, preserve nicely the soft tissue. You can gradually tighten or release uh, the circlage bar in order to play with your amount of stabilization and until you have the final perfect uh, result. The problem is always that you have to play with six degree of freedoms uh, in each, each fragment and you have to downsize uh, these uh, degrees of freedom and uh, circlage use of circlage wires is one of the techniques uh, where we can get uh, more stability, gradually more stability during the reduction and fixation uh, process. And now we come to a point which I was mentioning before, the combination of locking screws and circlage wires. Uh, we have heard that um, locking screws are very strong and stable against uh, shear forces. Uh, they provide good shear resistance, but they are very poor for pull out. And I would like to share with you this uh, uh, 86 year old patient after a fall uh, on the left hip. Very prosthetic uh, situation, proximal. Uh, so this is the post operative firm, one week post operatively with uh, reasonably good aligned uh, plate position and, uh, and uh, <clears throat> fracture reduction. Uh, this is five weeks post operatively. Uh, which we made, which made us uh, also not uh, unhappy yet. But uh, when uh, patients uh, showed up nine weeks uh, postoperatively now with pain and some strange feeling, we see the plate has pulled out, as mentioned, bad pull out uh, stability, good shear resistance. And when it's com combined with a uh, circular joie, this is. Um, uh, the combination of uh, the best of two worlds. The circular uh, wire has poor shear forces, but good pullout resistance. And the screw has good shear force, but bad pullout. So when we combine these two, we have, uh, uh, we can reach uh, the best of two worlds. And uh, like here, uh, fracture healed uneventfully uh, uh, later on. <clears throat> Avoid projection errors. That's this very important. This, uh, the plate is not in a vertical position. Um, and the question is, uh, is the plate uh, properly centered? And uh, the question is, mm, it's hard to say. The answer is, uh, uh, it's hard to say because we have a situation like here. Mm, uh, so the plate is in mid shaft uh, of the uh, center to the mid shaft of the femoral shaft, but the vector for the screws is going a more posterior. And when we have then only slight shifts of the plate posteriorly, we see that the vector is, uh, is, uh, is not uh, uh, fixed well enough into the femoral shaft. So we need to consider uh, this uh, in order to avoid fixation errors and fixation problems. So don't get fooled by images like this. This not necessarily says uh, everything is all right. <clears throat> Alignment control, very important. Biological uh, fixations have more risk of uh, malalignment, uh, frontal and sagittal. That's how we uh, control this. We use the electrocarder cable projected to the center of the femoral head, and then we go back to the ankle 
and go to the center of the talus. And before we made sure that the patella is centered uh, uh, um, uh, in the middle of uh, the knee. And then we get an idea how uh, the alignment is. It's a very simple, effective uh, technique. It is very important that the image, the center of the image is the center of the femoral head or vice versa. It, it Make sure, don't accept uh, projections where the center of the femoral head is somewhere outside the center because this also causes uh, projection errors and um, might compromise uh, your result. Uh, front, um, another plane which is frequently forgotten is uh, the torsion. And we have described this lesser tro trochanter shape sign. Um, this uh, should be equal. We store the image intent intensifier contour of the contralateral side. Once we made sure the patella is centered and facing uh, strictly anterior, then we store it in the image intensifier and uh, compare it intraoperatively with the other side. And uh, we have a small range of what we accept uh, according to a large uh, uh, research study. This is typically um, uh, as the lesser truck is uh, less prominent. That's uh, typically an external rotational deformity uh, where uh, after rotating the femur until the patella is facing anteriorly, uh, the contour is hiding behind the femur and vice versa. Internal rotational deformity is a more prominent uh, lesser truck. So uh, you sometimes can tell also uh, from the pelvic X-ray that uh, there is a, a patient with a potential uh, um, uh, um, torsional uh, deformity. This is well known, but other things are less well known. Um, uh, and uh, especially when it goes to the lateral view uh, and you have short, short distal main fragments. These are very difficult to judge, especially if, um, if you have um, a, a plate here, which hides uh, large parts of the fracture lines here. So you cannot uh, easily say, is this uh, hyperflexed or hyperextended because this is all hidden. And uh, um, the um, Blumenzart line from the contralateral side is helpful if you have stored it in the image intensifier and printed out before the operation, but also watch the notch sign. The Geno Recovatum has a larger notch because the distal main fragment is then flexed. And uh, the more it flexes, the larger this notch gets projected on the uh, C-arm or on the X-ray. So if you see an, an AP X-ray like this with a deep notch, you can be sure that this is a, a patient in hyperflexion uh, uh, recovatum uh, de deformity. So notch sign is something which should uh, keep in mind. And this is combined uh, with an hyperextension uh, of, the, of the leg. So you should check how, how is the hyperextensibility of the contralateral side and keep this in mind in order to judge your recovatum uh, position. And uh, this has been described many years ago already in uh, the orthopedic uh, literature in order to control sagittal plane. And finally, uh, if we are in the situation where we have collar screws, especially uh, in the distal femurs, they are helpful because they say we have uh, the situations that we have uh, at metaphysial level, we have a large and wide medullary cavity, especially in the elderly. Um, and with the help of uh, the polar screw, we can limit and reduce the drifting of the implant. And uh, I would uh, like to share with you this final case. Uh, it's, a, <clears throat> it's a young patient with this uh, uh, two segmental uh, fracture, which was addressed with a retrograde nail. Um, uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, here 
while the nail was inserted and as a fragment was broken out. But overall, uh, uh, it seemed uh, not to be uh, not too bad, despite we can see here already some tendency for, for virus. But after one year, she comes, uh, after the fracture is almost healed, uh, is already healed, she comes with medial knee pain. Uh, you see here the mechanical axis is going through the medial compartment. And uh, together with a positive MRI for medial meniscus pathology, uh, we brought her back to uh, theater in order to to uh, revise the fixation. We think always it's usually not the implant which is the problem, it's the fixation technique which is the problem. Uh, so we um, uh, go back to the operating theater and insert a polis, uh, remove the implant, uh, do, the, or do the osteotomy at the level and insert a polis group, forcing the uh, the implant to stay on the lateral side and once the nail is entering the proximal main fragment you see how nicely aligned uh, the fracture situation is now and not only nicely aligned it increases stiffness of the entire construct by a properly placed uh, medial polar screws forcing the nail to stay more on the lateral side according to pre-op planning. And once the nail enters the proximal main fragment, it shifts the proximal fragment in the uh, uh, perfect uh, uh, position. Here, uh, the post-operative result. Uh, before the operation and after the operation, we see that we have uh, uh, a nice alignment. We can keep the alignment with the polar screw. We can keep the implant on the more on the medial aspect of the of the leg, in order uh, to uh, maintain uh, a nice mechanical axis uh, for this uh, patient after after a correction, and she had a, a good uh, fracture healing. So let me summarize ten practical tips and tricks. For distal femur fractures, uh, we have to have a good uh, decision making regarding the approach. Intraarticular tarpo, extraarticular MIPO approach from lateral. The use of shine screw, two shine screw are more helpful because you have better control for the fine tuning, these tiny little rotations. The distractor in the list tractor uh, uh, mode. Very helpful, described by Reto Pops, fence technique in order to control uh, uh, the position on the distal femur, mini plates for temporary uh, a small fragment reduction to get more quiet uh, and less sta unstable uh, reduction situation, circlage application uh, with the minimal invasive uh, circlage, wire pass uh, circlage in combination with locking screw very strong. We have projection problems. We need to know about this. Alignment tools, the cable technique, uh, and uh, the laser to hunter shape sign. And finally, polar screws for retrograde uh, nailing can be very advantageous in uh, several instances. So thank you very much uh, again uh, for your attention. I hope these uh, tips are helpful for you. Hello. Nice. Thank you, Christian. Yeah, Professor Kretek, thank you very much. And uh, there are a few questions from the audience. Can I uh, request you to answer them, sir? Sure. Yeah. The one question is, how can we compare the lesser trochanter of the other side when we are putting the leg on the leg holder? Yeah, <laughs> good question. This uh, needs to be done before the operation. Not only so you start with the you start the operation with uh, checking the lesser two hundred shapes of the healthy side and uh, store it in the image intensifier and best is to print it out. Second, then you check the uh, the, uh, the hyperextension range of the contralateral side in order to have it when when you need it. So third is you store the 
uh, Blumen's outline uh, uh, position uh, in, in, in the image intensifier and print it out. So you have uh, full control of these parameters, but once you have put it somewhere or uh, try to uh, assess it intraoperatively, it's getting difficult. Uh, there is another question from the audience regarding the plating that uh, you showed. So the question asks, do you suspect that in this case of periprosthetic fracture, uh, the top, uh, the hip there is a gap between the hip prosthesis and the top of the plate, and could that lead to a stress area? Yeah. As it's uh, in, in the, uh, uh, when, when, it, when it was operated first. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you can criticize this. Um, no, no, I'm not criticizing. It's the audience that is asking this question. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's a very good question. And it's a very old question. Um, people are saying uh, you should overlap it. Otherwise, you are facing the risk of fatigue fractures. Um, yes, uh, you either leave it longer or you overlap, but um, a few centimeters are critical. I think the study showed four or six centimeters uh, um, is getting too close and the, uh, your risk of fatigue fracture rises with a uh, with, uh, smaller distance between plate and, and uh, prosthesis. Uh, another question is, do you choose a retrograde nail in such cases is what one um, no, I think, um, yeah, uh, I, I, I think uh, the, the use of plate is okay, but uh, as always, you, you many ways to skin a cat. Um, um, if, if, you, if you are a, a good, good nailer, uh, why not? But then you should stay away from, from, from the prosthesis and leave the gap as large as possible. Uh, another question that has come is that the plate that was used contained all monocortical locking screws. Do you think that was the right thing to do in the first place? In the uh, in the in the case with the screw pull out. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, absolutely agree. Um, yeah. uh, a, a two cortices have a double the pull out resistance compared uh, to, to one cortex. Um, one cortex has become popular because people say there is less risk of fatigue fracture between the prosthesis and, uh, and, uh, and the plate. And um, I have never seen really hard data supporting this. So I would have no problem in okay. using uh, bicortical screws. So one more question from my very close friend, Dr. Badrinath. Could you please explain the lesser trochantric sign? Yes. Um, uh, the lesser troch, uh, the lesser troch is, uh, is an anatomical structure which is a little bit behind the femoral shaft. So uh, when you have the opportunity next time to have a femoral a, a model of a femur in your hand, watch it and then very slightly turn it externally or internally. And you will see very small rotation makes quite significant difference of the shape. And we have done experimental study uh, looking at it and uh, you, uh, there is a certain threshold, but you can uh, be within 15 degrees of, uh, of uh, uh, rotational uh, changes. So small rotations make good change of the profile. Try it, try it once you have a thermal model. Thanks, Professor Kretek. Kretek, uh, well, we go to the next one. Since Professor Justin has a little bit less, less of time for us, uh, we would ask him to proceed, Ajit. Uh, we would ask you to, we would request you to hold on with your case for a while. Let Justin yeah. present and then no. we can uh, take it up. Professor Justin, are you there, sir? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Justin, you could go on with your case presentation. 
so that you have more time for discussion. I think Prof. Kretek has to uh, exit. No, no, not Prof. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Screen, screen. He has to stop sharing the screen. Ah, I sorry. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, done, done. Uh, Professor Justin, you go ahead. Uh, how to do it? Um, no, no. Uh, so, please. Uh, let's put ah, yes, screen. I see. I see. Um, uh, yeah, please click on the share screen button in the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Uh, please um, click on the share screen button. Share screen. Uh, ha, ha, ha. Uh, in the bottom? Bottom middle. Mm -hmm. Yes. Bottom and middle, there's a green button there, sir. Yes, there's a button. Yes. I have uh, made yeah, it. Button, yes. Then. I have yeah, done. Yes, yes I have seen it now. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Oh, of course. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm happy to see my Indian friends. And I'm also very happy to share uh, this session with Christian Kretek. We are very, have seldom the, the possibility to have a, a combined meeting. So I sent you some greetings from Leipzig, dressed for winter. We have a lot of snow and actually a temperature of more than minus 20 degrees. And you see the picture which I have made this morning. It's a little bit different to Bangalore now. And you mentioned uh, uh, Corona and you have known that uh, we have had a wave of uh, Corona disease in Germany and my hospital has uh, had the third highest amount of corona patients in Germany. We have had hundreds of corona patients and we have been really a hot spot in corona, but I believe we did it very well and we have a very, very small lethality. But I have to talk about distal femur. The problem is how to stabilize a distal femur. I have to admit, I'm a strong supporter of miss and preserving biology. I trust on an optimal primary fixation. And I try, I really try to avoid a medial additional plating. And I have to admit, you would not agree with my presentation, many of you. There are many publications and colleagues supporting double plating, especially in India, I know the fine book from Sunil Kulkarni and Babulka concerning uh, the media plating, but this is my personal opinion and also my personal uh, philosophy. Let's go into a trauma history. How I stabilized the distal femur fractures in the last decades. This is a picture of a patient I treated almost 30 years ago. It's a real complex trauma, bilateral, with severe fracture. But this was in 1992. And we made a very simple fixation with implants we have had in this time, not angle stable plates, not sophisticated intermedullary inter nailing system, and you see this a picture after six weeks, a pure bury plate, the first green silix and retrograde nail, an anticrat nail, unreamed anticrat nail, and a simple plate on the left uh, proximal tibia. So implants we would not use today. But this is a picture six months later, an uneventful uh, uh, procedure in a 51 year old lady, simple implants. We didn't have made any medial support. And this is a, uh, the clinical picture of the lady. Of course, she get a secondary correction of the left varus, but considering the severe injury, it's a good result. This is 10 years later. This is also a smashed distal uh, uh, femur fracture. And also this was one of the first uh, angle stem plates in the classical philosophy, uh, Christian Kretek showed it to you. Maybe that there is some uh, uh, recurvation of the, uh, uh, of the distal femur, but nevertheless, 
we have had four months later a good and sound healing. This is, we have done 10 years ago, an accident in a polytrauma patient with a C3 type fracture or yeah, C, C2 or C1, C1 type fracture, which has been also treated very simply with the angle stable plate. And also one year later, a good healing. No additional medial plating in a C1 complex fracture. What we wish, this is 10 years ago. You see 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, and 10 years ago, we have been very familiar with retrograde nailing. And uh, this is a picture similar to the case, it's an excellent case, Christian Gretek showed to you. And this is quite easily to treat with retrograde nail. And you see there was also an unstable pelvic uh, fracture, which is not the topic of today. And you see a correct healing, no medial support, one minimal invasive procedure. And this is two months and four months follow up. And you see a good cancellous uh, uh, bone consolidation on the medial side, quite nice anatomical reduction. And it's a very uh, uh, important is the anatomical curved nails you need in these fracture sites. Two years later, pain-free, quite good movement. 100 degrees, not optimal, but it's quite fine. What is the problem? When you have watched these cases, distal femur fractures and their stabilization should not be a problem. But of course, one bird doesn't make a summer. Uh, there are quite some questions. And the decisive questions are, is there a vital or non-vital prodatrosis or a fracture site? Is there a defect or not? And what is the optimal implant? And what we also have to consider, the more distant the fracture is, the more difficult it is to fix this fracture. We have less bone stock to fix it. I show you a case. Um, I show you a case, a 52 year old uh, lady with a supercondylar femur fracture, uh, an A321 fracture. This lady was treated in this configuration. Um, it's, it's very rigid. It may be minimal invasive, but from the fracture side, nice reduction, no virus. But you see, 12 months later, you have a certain, a certain virus, but it healed quite nicely here. You see a good colors formation. There was no breakage of the uh, screw. And this is the question uh, one of the participants has made uh, in osteoporotic bone. My philosophy is the elder the patient is, the more osteoporotic the patient is, the more I go in a rigid, absolutely stable fixation. And so if I have a 90 year old lady, 80 year old lady, I try to fix the fracture with as many screws as possible. And also President Gretik mentioned that in the elderly patient, you have a, a loss of periosteum. And the periosteum is, a, is a, uh, the reason and the fundament of biologic healing. And if you don't have this fundament of a good blood supplied periosteum, the less uh, biologic osteosynthesis uh, is failing. So the elder the patient is, the more I make a rigid fixation. And you see it, there is a certain non-healing, a certain avascularity. You see a resorption here. But we made the implant removal and we make a debridement. Also, there was no loss of reduction with iliac crest. And this is six months follow up. And now you see there's vitality. And all this case, we made a rigid fixation, absolute stability. The less biology you have, the more stability you need uh, provided by your osteosynthesis. 10 months follow up. Yes, we have to put the question, what causes troubles? Of course, misdiagnosis in the incorrect reduction. Christian Kretek showed you excellent presentation with the tools, how you avoid incorrect reduction. But we have 
beside the soft tissues, you have the problems due to the implants. So the correct election, the correct choosing of the implants is crucial. The less optimal implant you are choosing, the more you need an additional plate osteosynthesis. And you see here, this is a 53 year old patient with this secondary dislocated distal femur fracture. And then this was a presentation four months after the operation with a various uh, restricted mobility. And this is after uh, hardware removal and arthritis. And then you see 12 months later, there was this various complication and we had to make an, uh, an open wedge osteotomy coming from the medial side in this case. Open wedge because we want to uh, get some lengthening of the leg because there was also some shortening. And though I prefer an open wedge osteotomy to give some lengthening back to the leg. This is 15 months later. 18 months later, six months after osteotomy, and there's uh, going on a good healing. And of course, you need a good analysis and one good solution. You don't have to trust. And remember the first case uh, uh, showed by one participant, when the first shot, the first implant, the first operation is not optimal, then you are running into problems. And you see a bilateral distal femur fracture, a C1 uh, type fracture on the right side and um, uh, an, A1, an A type fracture on the left side. There was a bilateral uh, plate fixation, looking quite nice. Uh, today, I would probably Nick, uh, not use this screw. This is too close to the fracture side. The so similar is here, and you see also another optimal reduction on the, uh, uh, of the condyle side. And as I mentioned, there must be uh, 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 inappropriate osteosynthesis. You have breakage of the plates and non-unions. And now you see here the breakage of the plate. And be aware, this doesn't have to do anything with additional medial plate on or not. It only depends on the incorrect primary osteosynthesis. This screw is too much because you neutralize uh, the elasticity of, this, of the plate uh, by using this leg screw. And even if you would have made a medial plate osteosynthesis, this I'm in doubt whether there would have occurred a good healing. So we removed the plate. We made a valgus wedge osteotomy uh, and uh, that means a closed wedge osteotomy, a 95 uh, degree angle plate and the bone crafting on the right femur. And this is uh, uh, on the other side. And you see two and a half years after correction osteosynthesis on both sides, uh, it's a good healing and you can remove the implants. And you see if you use a good implant and a stable implant and sometimes the old horses are riding very well. And you see this is a classical plate, a cheap plate, but a stable osteosynthesis and you don't need any medial support and you could get a good healing. Sorry, we go ahead. Yes, like come back to the problems due to the implants. Choose the correct implant and choose the implant which is adapted to the need and the conditions of the patient. And we are seeing here in Europe more and more osteoporotic bone fractures, distal tibia fracture. And this is a 91 year old female. She had had a fracture, a Hoffa fracture three months ago, which has been treated in another hospital with a screw fixation, perforated screws. And then she came to our hospital with a new fracture uh, a C1 type fracture, the percondyle fracture. Of course, you can go now in a re osteosynthesis, but this is not my choice. And of course, you can say, okay, we make a stable uh, plate osteosynthesis, maybe also a medial, but then I make something 
and you see there's no chance for any osteosynthesis, and then we go into an arthroplasty. My message is, if you are over a certain kind of age, and if the, the distal, more distal the fracture is, this is a European school that we are going more and more in arthroplasty. But I repeat, this is for very old patients for very distal fractures. This is the 82 year old old female fractures, uh, C1 type fracture. And again, you see a very distal fracture. Of course, you can urge a plate to fix this, uh, uh, this fracture. And you can make also an additional plate osteosynthesis in this very finny corticalis in this 82 year old daily. But according my opinion, this is a better solution. Whether you need such a big uh, shape of osteosynthesis is another question, but the patient can make weight bearing at once. Uh, it's stable. You have less pain than with, uh, with osteosynthesis, though it makes it easier for the patient. Of course, you have the additional risk of periprothetic fractures. It's only an option. But I believe if you, you would use an osteosynthesis in this type of fracture very distally with a high chance of secondary failure and a re, re osteosynthesis and we know that the risk of lethality and mortality is increasingly dramatically the more you're operating these old patients. Looking is there at these cases, is there really a need for a double plating combined with a certain degree of soft tissue damage? I come back to my first uh, slides where I have to admit that I'm not a fan, a supporter of a double plating. But of course, there are indications. You see uh, a quite complex fracture, a C2 type fracture in a 41 year old male. This was treated, of course, minimally invasive. And the case Christian Kretek showed you, it's difficult to get here uh, a, a, a fixation in this area. Uh, so perhaps we could have chosen a little longer, a little bit longer plate, but nevertheless, it's okay. But we look, this is some, seven weeks after the operation. Sorry for the German words, but perhaps you can understand it seven weeks later. It's a suboptimal reduction, uh, the axis may be okay. But again, you see the breakage of the plate seven months after the first operation. What to do? Yes, we made a re synthesis and we made the additional plate. It's not a minimal invasive procedure. And of course, we don't know what is happening here with soft tissues. Of course, there was some cancellous bone additionally. One year later, it looks not very nice. You see also a secondary uh, axial deviation. We're going ahead. And you see the CT scan with a lot of sclerotic bones. And uh, I, I decided after two, little bit more than two years uh, to make an arthroplasty in this case. So my last case is also uh, uh, an, an indication where I see where I see the need of a double plating. Uh, this is a, a, a male, a male, a 52 years old with a accident, a traffic accident, uh, with a very big primary bone defect and so a C3 type fracture here. And of course, the primary stabilization is transarticular fixation by a hybrid fixator. And uh, five months, we have to, to do a lot of uh, uh, soft tissue uh, reconstruction. We started with a segmental transport that was a defect of about uh, 15 centimeter. You see the, the, the combination of the ring fixator. And now we get on, this is 15 months after trauma. This is a docking area, which is quite incomplete, the docking. But you know, it's very difficult. We made a long, long plate and there was a, uh, not a very good uh, remodeling of the bone, but it was infection free. Uh, again, we look here for the for the docking site, 
And this is for me an indication uh, for medial plating to get more stability at which we need in a, in a pseudarthrosis and we met also cancer bone and BMP7. And in this case, I'm absolutely convinced on the medial plating. This is one year and one and a half year after the trauma and a little bit more than uh, two, two years after trauma. And you see, there's a nice remodeling of the bone, a certain and going on consolidation of uh, the docking soon. Uh, you see the knee joint is quite good also. Uh, you see some beginning uh, uh, bony uh, destructions. And again, there was no complete, no complete consolidation. There was atrophic non-union and we had to go back and uh, remove all. We made a shortening with the angle stable plate in this case. And this is 28 months after trauma, a leg shortening uh, in this case. So my confession is correct reduction, protectives of tissues and the correct implant choice minimizes the need of double blading almost to zero. Again, you can attack me, you can criticize me, but this is my opinion and my philosophy, which has been very successful uh, during the last decades, and I'm convinced about it. So subparconella fractures remain a problem fracture, as Christian Fredrick uh, told it to you. Options in therapy are manifold. The indications to stabilize this fracture are more aggressive today, also concerning the different implants. Miss is a key issue. Reduction is still the basic. And the better the reduction is, and the less need you have for uh, medial plating. Arthroplasty is established in seldom cases, but more and more in our hospitals, the elder the patient is, the more distal the fracture is, the more arthroplasty is indicated in this distal femur fracture. And the indication for double plating is an option, but not in primary concerning to my confession. And though I finish my presentation and I'm open for your critical questions to me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Professor Justin. Um, it has been an eye opener sort of thing. There are plenty of questions uh, for you. Uh, is it not too long distance of 15 centimeter for bone transport procedure? And what are your what is your opinion on the masculine technique? Technique. Uh, so I the sound was very low. Can you, Ajay? Can you repeat? Yeah. Okay. Uh, isn't is it not too long for the 15 centimeter bone transport? And what is your opinion on the masculine technique in this case? Was, yes, uh, the masculine technique. Um, uh, the muscular technique is a little bit overstressed. It's, it has become a certain fashion in the last 10 years. The muscular technique is ideal. And when you look for the literature in certain uh, distal tibia fracture, it's not so appropriate in, uh, in the femur shaft fracture and also in the distal femur fracture. When I According to my knowledge of literature, the muscular technique in the femur is not so successful as in, uh, in, the, in the tibia side. So if I have a defect of four or five centimeter, I mostly go into a segmental transport, which you can do also by nail. Yeah, there is a, another question. I think this is directed to Professor Kretek from the last talk. Uh, would the lateral parapatellar approach compromise the lateral blood supply of uh, blood supply coming from patella? Because he says most of the blood supply to the patella is from the lateral side. Um, have a look on the anatomy books, and then you see that all the nerves and uh, with the nerves the structures um, come come from the medial side as well. So. Um, at least uh, we don't disturb the nerve, but uh, either side, if you do medial uh, approach for like uh, for knee prosthesis, 
that's fine. If you do a lateral approach uh, for the tarpo, it's fine, but never do both. That's very critical. But if you stay on one side consistently, that's not a perfusion problem. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you make a separate medial approach or do you use the same lateral parapatellar incision to put the medial plate and if uh, medial, separate medial incision, uh, please opine. That's Perfect. a very good question uh, because sometimes we have medial B-type fractures, medial B-type fracture, then I do a medial parapatellar approach. Okay. So, Justin, this one question is to you. Uh, you said that you have to fix these fractures more rigidly and less biologically. So that takes away the entire philosophy of, uh, of uh, an elastic fixation. Uh, where is the balance then? So uh, I have to repeat, I said, the elder the patient is and right. the more osteoporosis you have, you will do it. This decision, I would say, uh, until 70, 75, there is a biology appropriate to biologic uh, uh, fixation and to elastic uh, osteosynthesis. This is so my uh, thumb uh, 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 rule. Uh, but in a, if I have an 85-year-old patient or a 90-year-old patient with this femur fracture, I today in more than 90%, I go in a rigid fixation because so would, I want to have a stability. So you would fix in all the screw holes that are available to you? Yeah, not, not all. Uh, if I have a, 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 a 12 hole plate, maybe I all, only use 11 screws. But what I say that the screws are going very closely to the fracture side, yes. And I do as many screws in the, in the distal uh, condyle area. Uh, fine. Uh, one, one final question for you, Justin, on this talk uh, is that when Karl Stoffel was in Bangalore, he said that you, uh, you take a valgus test after fixation and see if there is any mobility. And if there is mobility on the table, you go ahead and fix the medial plate. Do you agree or you don't agree? Uh, so uh, please Raja, uh, repeat please i go closer to my yeah. micro okay carl stoffel when in bangalore you were there as well mm -hmm. he said that you fix the lateral plate and then check on the c arm yes and if there is mobility on the medial side then go ahead and fix the medial plate do you accept this concept or you don't accept this concept <laughs> um <laughs> if you see under the uh, X-ray control in the C arm, that there is some instability. With with yeah. then I believe that your primary osteosynthesis is not optimal. So uh, then I this I would not accept because I don't believe that this is an optimal osteosynthesis. If you see you have a primary fixation, you look for the C arm and you make it uh, a flexion or. Uh, axial deviation and you see some movement, I believe yeah. then you should uh, either switch your implant or make a better reduction. This would not be okay, for me an you. indication for medial plating. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, please go ahead with your next case, case presentation or talk. Uh, what's wrong? Yes, I have here, uh, um, as the time is, is uh, going on, uh, I have here one case. This is a. Yeah, go ahead. This is a 54-year-old okay. male. Uh, he you have had. To the a, audience, to the sorry. Professor Justin, you put it to the faculty uh, to answer the questions. You you moderate this session and present yourself. Uh, I moderate now. Yes, you present and moderate. Okay, I present and moderate. Yes, I have to look.
Ajá. Okay. So, I can I show my case now? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. You see my case here. This is a 54-year-old patient. You see the case? Yes. No. No, you have to... Uh, this is the previous uh, presentation, I think. Hmm? You have to change the presentation. No, it's, it's, uh, this, it's, it's okay. Mm -hmm. No, okay. this is not the... Okay, yes, I, I, I will do it. Do we see now? Mm. Uh, sir, try again. I'm not able. To I see. try. Try again, sir. No, he has to open his presentation and then share screen. So I tried. Do you see now? Yes. This is some, somewhere in the middle of the case. I think. No, no. It's the beginning of the case. But you see the x-ray. Yes, we see uh, an x-ray of a joint replacement and a periprosthetic yes. fracture. This was, okay, this is a, correct. This is a periprosthetic fracture, which has yeah. been treated by a plate. Yes. And I go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. This, this is um, follow up seven days later. You see, there was a loosening of the screws. Yes. What would you do now? Uh, this you have to rule out infection. Yes. So this is a, 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 a loosening of the plate. So we go ahead. We went, made a re -ososynthesis. We removed the plate. We made another angle stable plate. We made a lot of screws. We made also uh, a, a, a wire circlage here. Yes. Rajiv, your opinion, would we get a good result or what would you do? This is doubtful, sir. Looks good on the x-ray, but doubtful as the, as the result. Christian, what is your opinion? Yeah, as I mentioned before, uh, locking screws are good uh, for shear, but bad for pullout. And this case has nicely demonstrated it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, at the revision, you turned around one, one uh, circlage at the proximal level. Uh, but still the distal level is um, somehow unclear for me how it is secured. Question is, are the, are the locking screws distally inside the cement or are they short screws? And uh, this would be a, a concern for me. Yeah, uh, excellent analysis, of course. Uh, Christian, it's very difficult to place the screws uh, between the shield of yes. the uh, prosthesis and the stem of the prosthesis. So these are uh, short screws uh, and, and only these are screws uh, passing uh, uh, beside uh, or by cortical screws. And this analysis uh, from your side is absolutely correct. Yes, this is a readmission one, one week one month later. So the problem here was not the problem. You see, this was quite rigid. But here we have a stress shielding head on the, here on the soon. Uh, I don't know how to avoid it. Uh, I believe this screw is, 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 perhaps the screw is too near to the tip of the stem of the arthroplasty. Maybe uh, this was my analysis because uh, the fracture has just occurred there. But to analyze this to looking back is not looking forward. We are looking forward. Ajit, if you are on the scene, what is your 
or Binion? I think um, probably you'll need to put a longer stem. I think the distal fracture may be united. Maybe you will uh, you will need to get a CT scan. But then I think uh, a longer stem uh, TKR should do the job. I don't think we need to wait any longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is an interesting uh, opinion. But uh, sorry uh, to to remove. Uh, to remove this yeah. stem. That's that's going to be a huge challenge. Then you can make a distal femur replacement. Then you can throw away all this here. But it would be an option, I agree with you, if this patient would be 30 years older and not in your age. Sorry. Right. I, in which case, I think uh, keep that, put a new plate, long plate, where you will not have screws at the fracture side, you will have some sort of elasticity and allow it to heal. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Another option, another opinion. Professor Justin, this is uh, goes against your own uh, theory of rigid fixation. This probably is too rigid and that's why it failed. Yes. I, I agree with this criticism or with this, uh, uh, with this command. I agree, perhaps it was too rigid uh, in yes. this case. Okay, but what is now your, your solution would be to use a longer plate and uh, with more distance between the screws. Yes. This is the interoperative picture. You see not any more minimal invasive, not any more. We made another solution. And I'm uh, 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 more and more doing, I do this. Uh, instead of a medial plating, I use a medial strut graft. Uh, stay according my philosophy, a rigid fixation. And you see the screws are very close to the tip of the, uh, of the uh, stem. But what is uh, very important that, or what I do strongly do is to make screws through the plate, cross, uh, beside uh, the stem and fixing on the contralateral side, uh, the uh, strut graft. You see here, you see here, yes. and you see here. Is this, um, Christian, you are also very, very experienced with allografts. You are doing a lot of allografts in, in tumors. And so what is your opinion concerning this? Yeah, I, uh, we, we do not use uh, strat, uh, strat grafts um, routinely. Mm. Our concern is um, that, um, mm, reliability of, of ingrowth. So yes, I have seen good results in the literature and presentations uh, in the humerus um, at various levels um, in a lesser amount on the low extremity. Um, I watch it, but I don't use it. Mm. Thank you for your uh, open answer. I, I shared your doubts, absolutely. Uh, before I started with this, this is two weeks later. I make this X-ray just to control that there is no loss. And again, you see uh, how many screws we used to fix the strut graft. And the, the crucial thing is not only to place the strut graft on the medial side to place it. This is not the strut graft must be as as stable as possible. And though I make a 360 degree construct. Uh, of this uh, area uh, be, so that it is stable. And this is a follow up after eight months. And you see a very, very good bony consolidation, absolutely fine callus uh, formation. And um, so we do it now more and more. I do it since three or four years. Uh, 
because I saw with this uh, uh, sandwich philosophy uh, uh, a strut graph which is fixed with the in integrated in the plate uh, or the synthesis, uh, this makes a, a quite good result. But this is a, a colibri, uh, not, not today, we are using it quite routinely, but it's, uh, uh, it's only preserved for certain kind of cases we have had uh, uh, to have to do re osteosynthesis. The strut graft is never an option in primary peripotetic fractures. So this was uh, a case uh, just for discussion. Wonderful case, uh, Christoph. Congratulations. I, I, I have a question. Um, did you also use Cancellus uh, bone graft in addition to your biological plate? Um, in, in this case, uh, we didn't it, but uh, I we do combine it more and more with RIA, that we use a lot of, that we also use uh, cancer bone surrounding this uh, strut graft, uh, because you, it's, it's not an open procedure. You have to, you have seen uh, uh, the picture, the interoperative uh, uh, picture here. Uh, you are, it's an open procedure. And then if I place the strut graft on the medial side, so I, if possible, I make also additional cancer response. Any question? Okay. So, Professor Justin. Yes. Do you, do you routinely use the fibular, fibular graft? Yes. It's uh, in, 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 in graph quite often. It's it's a, 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 a fibula graft which we buy. It's not an an, an uh, uh, autogenous fibula graft. But it's a it's a, a fibula graft from um, Christian. Uh, what is uh, von Reichen? A donor. Hello, Graf. From donors. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. From yeah. donors. Okay. okay. So I have to leave because I have another urgent meeting. Uh, no trouble. Professor, thank you for the excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Justin, for your excellent... Uh, I, I hope, I hope to see you all in Bangalore. Yes. And Christian, it was a big, big pleasure to have a meeting together with, with you, which has been very, very seldom in the last decades. And... Oh. Uh, uh, Yes, Thank also Christian, herzlichen Dank, ja. See you. And I'll see you in Bangalore next time. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. yes. yes Good plan. You, you are a very popular figure here in Bangalore, Professor. <laughs> see you all, my friends. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So we'll go with, with uh, Dr. Ajit uh, for his uh, interesting case presentation. Uh, Dr. Ajit, sir, please. Uh, Dr. Ajit can go ahead with his uh, presentation. Uh, share screen. I need to share my screen. Go ahead, sir. I'm not able to share my screen because the host has apparently disabled. Hey. Right, I'm share. ready for co-host. Try again, sir. Try again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Full screen. Just one moment. Yeah, full screen here. Yeah. Okay, so I'm on the screen. Or uh, we can see your screen. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this is a slightly different case to what uh, we have seen all the time. So um, more for uh, discussion than anything else. So. I think we'll have an interactive uh, discussion here. Anybody will take this up? This particular fracture, anybody amongst the faculty, apart from what Professor that? Kretik? Well, it looks like a postromedial part of the femoral condyle. So most likely a Hofa type of fracture. So, the... Can you hear me, Ajit? Yeah, yeah, we can, I can hear you. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Dr. Sorry. Rajiv wants to say something. Isolated posterior condyle fracture. 
Yeah. It actually looks like a postural lateral from the lateral side. There seems to be some... Yeah, fibula, postural lateral, hope of lateral side. Yeah, okay. So, what to do? How to go about it quickly? I, I will require a CT. Right, sir. Okay. You have it. You ask for it. You have it. So, what do we do? Yeah, just let me let us study it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, quite badly communicated. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any How old is this patient is only about 34, 36. 34, 36. Okay. And no other injuries, no neurovascular uh, issues. So this is the problem. Any inputs? And then we can ask Professor Kretek for his opinion. No matter what you do, a fixation with this, I still feel arthritis is sure to occur. Hmm. So, with that in mind, we'll have to plan the surgery. Right. Okay. Essentially, I put this up to uh, ask for opinion about the approach. What yes. do we do? Yes. How do we go about it? Professor Kretek wants to say something, sir. Yeah, it's a, it's a very uh, severe injury and uh, displaced uh, posterior uh, posterior lateral fragment. And uh, not only uh, the posterior fragment is a problem, it also has some impression zone at the posterior end of the so-called intact Yes, yes. A large femur piece. Yeah, and yes. uh, as this is pr frequently not acknowledged, and people try to use the contact as a reference, but this mm -hmm. will not fit because mm -hmm. it's deflected, it, it's impressed. And okay. um, uh, one part of the of the solution to this problem is uh, that we uh, need to go in with a chisel and elevate it, that we have a, a physiological uh, uh, situation, a physiological curve, and then buttress it with some inner bone graft uh, because then there is some empty wedge. So you mean in this area, Prof, if you can see my arrow? Exactly. Yeah, in that area. And you okay. see that this is more dense. Right. And uh, yeah. Yeah. when you try now to put in the, uh, the big chunk of bone, right. it won't fit because the reference is uh, displaced and impressed okay. in it. But it's very stable because uh, sometimes it's round and it's, it's, it, it's not apparent uh, for the first view. Right, okay. So the other uh, aspect is, um, is that it's difficult to fix it sufficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a vertical shear uh, 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 sort of mechanism. And um, uh, we usually, uh, in addition to posterior anterior screw fixation, we also buttress it with a, a, a small, short buttress plate. Uh, okay. Okay. Yes. But for this particular fracture, what would your approach be looking at the CT scan, Prof? Postolateral. Yeah, postolateral post approach. Yeah. Postolateral. Post and is the patient is prone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So posterior approach could be an option as well. Yes. And um, uh, we would uh, go for it uh, with the postolateral approach, and uh, we wouldn't. Do any minimal invasive thing. This is <laughs> right for uh, minimal <laughs> right. invasive. Okay. So I think then I'll quickly share what was done. So it, this is the prone position, and uh, that's that's your vessel there at the back, okay. and that's the other vital structure. That's the common peroneal nerve at the at the side there, and this is the popliteal crease, the knee crease, knee joint crease there. So, and there, there's the head of the fibula, the tip of the fibula there, just for orientation sake to get the landmarks. And uh, went in, that's the uh, nerve there. 
that's the lateral head of the biceps that's the nerve there so isolated that and then went medial that the nerve is here now and we went medial to the um, head of the gastrocnemius got the reduction and unlike what prof said i i did not actually uh, understand the impaction part of it although we do see that in the acetabular fractures and also in the medial plateau but i did not understand it so we just placed it back in an anatomical position and uh, got that back we're still on the medial side so some k wires to get the reduction multiple k wires to get the reduction there fragments were helped many in in place and uh, then went on the uh, lateral side of the uh, uh, biceps tendon and put a plate there you see the lax screws there where the k wires were and this is the plate on the uh, lateral aspect of the femur lateral to the biceps tendon so that was the fixation that was on table very nice that's what was done and uh, i didn't use a small plate i somehow like these uh, old conventional evo plates so that was the immediate fixation there was a significant comminution that part i could not get it properly done yeah and this was the three month follow up as you can see there is a little bit of opening out on the lateral side yes. but he was stable i did not put up the video he was walking well that's the range of movement that he has at uh, union yeah ajit uh, you see many yes, uh, due to lack of musculature there yeah uh, It, uh, many a time it forms as a loose condyle itself coming to the hand while operating did you encounter any such problems uh if you can we did not actually condyle will come to the hand because of the uh, it has no attachments there yeah yeah it it will be because the patient was lying prone that was not a major issue it was directly there so we didn't pull it out or anything whatever little bit of soft tissue periosteum was attached we just left it there and just put a couple of k wires to jiggle it into place and pass on the uh, k wires further down long term vasculature problem i mean any chance of avian going into the the condyle one any long term such uh, did you see that he may end up with degenerative arthritis but uh, he is now two and a half years down the line there is no avian i don't have the current pictures unfortunately but uh, no uh, avian as such okay ajay dr ajay yes sir think, uh, use of mini plates and screws help you to improve the reduction as professor kretak had shown yes uh, use of mini plates and screws as a temporary uh, reduction actually device. actually i never thought about it till i heard his lecture just now <laughs> but while i was listening to the lecture also i was thinking whether that would actually come in the way of my definitive plate that's my okay Okay. Yeah. No, but they are supposed to be temporary plates, not uh, on a for the same. Uh, yeah. Right, sir. Yes, sir. I, I, I was quite yeah. happy with the thick K wires yeah. that were holding the fragments in yeah. place, so that was all right. Yeah. It's it's uh, the yeah, idea is for good. if you have only point contact, very yeah. few contact, yeah. yeah. then it's it's helpful. But here you have a, a large area. Of large. Space. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. So I'll stop sharing the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Last board debate. Yeah. Sir, can I take the please take uh, take your last talk? Okay. I uh, share my screen. And uh, I uh, before I start, I would like uh, to go back. It was a, it was a question of. Uh, Is it okay? One participant regarding. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. From one of our friends called. I would uh, like to go back to um, to the question of one participants regarding the lesser two hundred shape sign, and I have pulled out uh, an an image which uh, demonstrates it. Uh, here we have the femur, so uh, and it is cut. in the mid shaft 
and look, only very few millimeters of rotation cause a significant change of the lesser truck. Can you see the shape? Yes, of yes sir. beautiful. Only very few change uh, creates a change. And then I have a, a little video as well. Look, small rotations due to the eccentric uh, position of the lesser trochanter make a significant change in the profile. And here also in the lower part, you see the bilateral situations, small changes already enough to make the lesser truck disappear and reappear or be prominent. So that's the philosophy um, of the lesser truck hunter uh, shape sign. And I think there is also a paper from India which has uh, uh, shown uh, that this is also in a, in a clinical study, a helpful uh, tool for the assessment of um, uh, torsional deformities. So wonderful demonstration, sir. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and you want me to do now case discussion? Yeah. OK. okay. And um, okay. it's about uh, bone defects. And I have uh, uh, three cases. And uh, I would like to share, share them with you. The first one is a little bit more uh, more easy, and it's a 62-year-old patient with a, a large osteochondral defect of the distal femur, of the anterior part of the lateral condyle. And the bone is gone, and even the police dog could not find it. So... <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we have uh, we have a problem, and uh, this is the intraoperative situation uh, where we have a six uh, by eight by three centimeter, so it's hundred forty four cc uh, defect. Uh, so I would like to. Uh, <laughs> to ask the um, uh, faculty, and maybe Rajiv, uh, uh, I would like you to ask if you would like to start. What, what's your idea about this and what's your comment? It's an open injury, of course, and we have this big, the bone is missing. At the, at the moment, uh, do not worry about this uh, bone defect. Uh, get on with the soft tissue management and uh, fracture management, uh, damage control, and then look, uh, take the next step. Okay, good, good, good point. Prof, is there a CT? Because I'm not able to figure out where exactly the bone loss is from. The, is that the medial condyle? Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a lateral condyle and the anterior part. So what you see here is uh, medial. This is lateral, okay, okay, okay. left is distal, this is proximal. All right, and okay. bottom is lateral. So we see from, from, from anterolateral onto the wound. And unfortunately, uh, this is a case from the 90s. So in that time, we haven't done a regular CT scans. Now we do, but at that time we, we didn't. So, uh, Dr. Kumar, Yes, sir. I think for the moment, uh, anyway, it's an open fracture, so you need to uh, thoroughly uh, wash out the wound, debride it. And I think uh, I would, at least in the given, uh, in the current scenario, I would think of putting a lateral plate and uh, uh, I will, the, the defect there, I will put a cement spacer vancomycin loaded cement spacer as a temporary measure um, get my uh, fixation or more maybe a definitive fixation itself on day one after the debridement with bone cement and then start to worry about how to reconstruct the articular surface 
in india we have very limited options about uh, articular uh, reconstructions and allograft availability but i think eventually you will need to have an allograft uh, uh, graft here ask a question sir uh, as there is no articular cartilage the post op range of movement will cause stiffness so you might have to think on some other line a joint replacement is that possible because articular cartilage is not there yeah you won't get good range of movement even if you fix the fracture okay you might end so up when when would you what would be your strategy in terms of timing so you mentioned uh, uh, joint replacement yes uh, what what would your your time timing you would do initially just damage control external fixation and early joint replacement or fix okay. it and do late replacement what's your strategy my concern is that you if you will end up having restriction of movements okay so the arthroplasty if if it's possible by the arthroplasty team to do it at this stage i'll prefer to do it early so early okay dr uday kumar is this your point as well yeah i, I would look and see that there is first there is no infection second is as dr ajit said that probably i'll put a lateral plate and wait till all the soft tissue and everything heals and then plan for the next stage yeah yeah. yeah yeah i would like to get a good primary bone stock initially and uh, keep the joint arthroplasty as a second stage procedure mm. and in terms of timing yeah later first the later. good one those combination should depending on the problems yeah yeah okay good uh, oh, i think all good points um let's move on and um, yeah. that's what we did or what's the search yeah. that did it was done by my friend peter shantelmeier in the 90s and uh, he uh, reduced the fracture we used temporary cavas in the medial condyle okay. and you see this wedge type of articular large articular bone defect but he added a, a lateral plate as if there would be no defect and then added as aji said um a cement spacer and um actually the idea was to put in the cement as a as a short term solution to to do two things to increase stability and second to um have a uh, open fracture a uh, high level of um antibiotic um concentration so uh they closed it over drains and uh what happened is, is that the patient did very well with the cement spacer <laughs> Uh, uh, Dr. Shandelma very nicely shaped the cement to the natural curve of uh, of the articular surface, and uh, in the lateral compartment, in the anterior part, the uh, the, the role of the articular surface is yes. less important than the central loaded part of the medial compartment. We all know this: the uh, lateral part is more forgiving than the medial part. and uh, <laughs> this is a 73 year old patient and is now 9 years after trauma when this picture has been made so it uh, we saw him regu regularly every year and told him yeah one day uh, there is a time will come when it will uh, he will develop pain and so it was so he after 
after 17 years, he got a knee prosthesis. And I, I, we have a long follow-up. I last saw him on 2015 after 17 years with very low pain and with a Lissom score 74 out of 100. So quite interesting. Yeah. Um, cement spacer can sometimes help us uh, bridging um, a, 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 a problem, bridging a defect. And um, I thought this is an interesting nature experiment, uh, which teaches us uh, that uh, cement might be an option for defects in open fracture. And they can That's a very excellent case, Professor Kretek. If this patient was there in today's scenario, would you do the same thing or would you think of an osteochondral graft? No, no. no? He's too old and um, this is too complex. I, I think, uh, I, think uh, yeah, I would do the same. Same, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think this is a good solution for our patients. Yes, yes. yes. Also, also it's, it's something simple. like using cement in giant cell tumors. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's simple, it's cheap, it's effective, it's mechanically yes. uh, and good, it works. and um, helps the patient to, to to bridge for one and a half decades. Yes, fantastic. How fantastic case. How can you see that the cement doesn't loosen if we try it today also? Yeah, um, doesn't put matter. Screw, doesn't matter. It's it's fixed with the screws. Yes, which yeah. I, I, I guess it's probably very rigid. Yeah. Excellent. So um, then uh, I have other case, two other cases, and I'm curious about your uh, opinion. This is uh, <clears throat> a patient uh, who came okay. uh, a long time ago, and he had... Uh, she was 60 something and she is from Cologne and she was on a, on a traffic light as a, a pedestrian. And suddenly uh, she was waiting uh, correctly. And all of a sudden a, a little mini bus or mini truck came around the corner, lost balance and crashed her leg between uh, the car and the pole of the traffic light. So this was an open fracture, isolated fracture. She came to the local hospital and they spoke to her and told her, oh, this is a big problem. Uh, we should better amputate it. And she is a very um, body-oriented person and said, no, never, never, ever, uh, this will happen. And uh, do whatever you can to, to salvage my limb. And then um, the surgeons um, uh, tried to fix her. And um, my question is, how would you try to, to approach this, this complex, wide open, fracture, floating knee. Nightmare. Any neurovascular compromise, sir? No. Nerves intact, vascularity intact. Okay. Healthy, um, healthy patient, but old. To me, to me the soft tissue injuries uh, would be more damaging than the radiology. So I would take the help of a plastic surgeon. Uh, as of moment, joint uh, damage control, external fixator, wound management, wound mm -hmm. cover, and then think what to do. Yeah, good, a very good point. Now with VAC, we also have good, good tools to, to address it. <clears throat> but uh, they have done uh, early fixation. And I show you how uh, this looked like. And they have done a retrograde nail and external fixator uh, in terms of uh, a joint preserving way 
you see the large tibial bone defect. There is only minor uh, bone defect on the femur. But the main problem after a few days, you can see it from the wound. This is heavily contaminated. Yeah. And uh, the surgeons uh, went to the patient a second time and told her, we need to amputate this. And um, patient refused and uh, she called her son. Son is uh, a friend of our family and uh, uh, I told him that's uh, from the pictures very difficult, but if she likes, she can come and we have a look. So she flew over to Hanover okay. and, and I still remember when she entered our entrance room, the sweet smell <laughs> she had <laughs> through her dressings. And here you see the list of all the all the bacteria she had, pseudomonas, <laughs> enterobacter, enterococcus, uh, all cloacae, in fact, all the fecal uh, uh, germs. And um, for the third time, we spoke with her. This is a desperate uh, situation, and uh, we are worried that we can salvage this limp. So we said, um, <clears throat> we brought her to the theater, and did what we routinely call a welcome debridement. So every patient with open fractures coming from, from other places, uh, he gets a welcome debridement uh, that we see from inside the wound. We judge the wound in person, we wash out everything, etc. Cetera, et cetera, to have, a, have a, some sort of a starting point. So we did this <clears throat> and uh, then um, debrided her, uh, all the implants were infected, also the knee joint, and uh, removed all infected bone. And that's what we got. Oh my. We had a 42 centimeter defect. So you see here, that's... <laughs> the remaining tibia, the posterior part is a bit, a bit longer. This is tendon. And we see here the patella. So it looks beautiful. We have a tuberosity. And uh, here ends oh, the this top. So this is 42 centimeters. So, and um, we had we had the task of the patient to to we had no permission to do uh, amputation, so we had to do some sort of uh, fixation. And my question is, do do you have any any suggestions uh, uh, what we uh, what uh, how we could do this? Because we have, um, if we want to keep this and maybe later do some sort of replacement, um, that would be one option. One option would be replacement. The other option would be uh, some sort of a bone transport uh, ending up in an arthrodesis, but this would take for years. Yeah. So we were aiming for replacement. But uh, with the replacement uh, target, we need to have some sort of a spacer. Any, any, any ideas to keep links, to keep the extensor mechanism, to prevent the extensor from shortening, which frequently occurs uh, which keeps some motion. So best, best, best ideas come in, in theater at the operating table. So what we did is 
we built together um, some sort of a, a custom made low low profile low cost joint from uh, uh, used implants uh, we used her sterilized uh, femoral nail as a temporary femoral spacer and a tibial nail and we formed with bone cement some sort of a, a hinge uh, from PMMA cement uh, to hold the axis. Yeah, this is the axis, uh, a shunt screw or a piece of a shunt screw. So um, this keeps us links. This keeps us, uh, uh, <clears throat> we are able to move the, the pseudo uh, leg as the pseudo joint and um, maintains uh, uh, Links. The other problem we are, have is the patella. So we can uh, move her leg over, over the back ceiling. And in order to maintain the extensor mechanism, we fix it to the tibial part of the bone. You see here is the cement spacer. The, the knee uh, uh, extensor mechanism was nicely put over a uh, strap over, over the, the, the knee. Then we <clears throat> put on a vac, uh, called the plastic surgeon, and uh, she got a free flap. And that's the situation. After the free flap, she is uh, exercising on the CPM. Uh, we had additional external bridging, external fixation in order to maintain uh, stability once we she was ambulating. Um, and uh, the vacuum ceiling was sterile from the first revision. So we thought, okay, we con can continue with free flap. And uh, that's how it looked uh, after the free flap, and we know these large skin defects, they take a lot of time until they are dry and ready for the next step for knee replacement. So it was important that we exercised her and kept her soft tissues mobile. And after two and a half months, all the split skin graft, uh, uh, was dry again, and the donor site skin graft uh, uh, site was uh, dry again. So we were able to do uh, as a next step and plan for a tumor prosthesis. And um, that's how we ended. And uh, she needed a second free flap in order to, to cover the need for space because uh, prosthesis again needs, needs space if she wants to reflex. And that's her after nine operation with, <laughs> with two flaps, <laughs> nice and dry soft tissues, uh, limited range of motion, good nerve function. Uh, there was never any problem with her, uh, um, with a drop foot or anything. And uh, she had nine operations. She, <laughs> she walks pain-free three kilometers, no crutches. <laughs> she climbs stairs. She, she drives her Mercedes-Benz. And most important, <laughs> she complains about scarring. <laughs> so you can imagine what sort of conversations these were. Uh, and um, she frequently showed up uh, every year uh, for five or six years. And after six years, she developed a low grade infection. Increasingly, her range of motion became every year a little bit less. So at the end, she had a, had a range of motion of about um, maybe uh, 40 degree and an active extension gap. So 
and she got this low-grade infection with a fistula. And then uh, we spoke with her again. And uh, that's the, the, the end of the story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, it took a lot of time to convince her. She is now uh, mid 80s. She is now 85. Uh, she still doesn't like to have her leg amputated. I didn't do a very good job with the amputation. You see the medialization of the of the abductors, and I left the the femoral prosthesis yeah. in because I thought she would be a good candidate for an endoexoprosthesis because she, she then would have a very good contact to the ground and a better function than she has yet uh, here. So she is active, she is mobile, she still drives her Mercedes-Benz, but uh, is not uh, perfectly happy. So... <laughs> Mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. <laughs> Question. Sir, sir, at least for six years she had a uh, limb there. Sir, initially uh, that should satisfy her said, enough. Uh, how did you maintain the flexion? Uh, during the initial period? Yeah, I, I let her. Ex uh, yeah, the, we opened the external fixator for the exercises. We opened the oh. external fixator. And uh, here, look here on the right side, she still has the X, X, X fixed pins. Yeah. But uh, for a couple of hours every day, we had her open to exercise. And uh, when she was walking, we, we fixed it. Good. Do we have time for another case or any comments or questions or? Meshing. Sir, we have time. Uh, uh, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, but uh, I don't think anybody can ask any questions. You have done a phenomenal job on this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is also a challenging case. Um, train accident goes back in 1992. I still see the patient uh, today. So um, it uh, says he survived because, and it was an very young patient, 29 years, isolated injury of the left femur. He was intubated on the scene and arrived about two hours after the accident. And very important, he had a pale and pulseless left foot. And we did an x-ray and he has this 18 centimeters, not 42, only 18 a def a <laughs> centimeter defect of the distal femur. So isolated injury, young patient, not responsive because he's intubated and it's two hours after the injury. So what's, what's your... Um, how would you manage uh, this, uh, this patient? Ajit. Um, since, there is a, since there is a vascular injury, I think the soft tissue care and uh, restoration of the vascularity is of prime importance. That takes precedence over everything else. I think probably on day one, thorough debridement, X-fix and vascular repair. And then... Uh, plan to do um, reconstruction. Um, looking at the distal fragment, the articular segment looks very, very short, very, very <laughs> distal there. Yeah. So that's a huge challenge. Yeah. So, and, um, yeah, go ahead. On day one, yes, uh, the priority is to uh, save the limb. So yeah. soft tissue, debridement, X-fix, vascular repair, and maybe... In this day and age, uh, WAC and wait and uh, secondary reconstruction. Yeah, good point. Uh, um, in terms of um, uh, uh, priorities, going first to the NGO suite and secondary to the OR, or go right away to the OR. Dr. Kuma, how is your point of view? 
where where is the vascular lesion following the angio we Have don't know but uh, common says common sense says probably um, at the some some somewhere here yeah and he had good pulses at the yeah. uh, groin so good question groin. good comment good good normal pulses at the groin yeah. but no pulses at the, at the, at the, at the foot also with ultrasound no nothing pale foot How is this? Is this stable, sir? Uh, or you would have yeah, lost? Yeah, it? yeah. It's responsive to fluid oh. replacement. Got some blood oh. and. Or he could yeah. be in shock and uh, and so on, and then that will. Yeah, he was tachycardic, uh, but but not uh, in. Not stabilized. In, 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 in stabilized. Go for vascular. Uh, responsive patient. Oh, okay. Sir, uh, I would of course uh, take care of the soft tissue, do the, all the debridement, but stabilize the segment for vascular repair. Yeah. Then go ahead with the yeah. vascular. Yeah. So, so CT scan or going directly to theater? No, directly to the theater first. Yeah. And no. then uh, stabilize him. Yeah. And stabilize him uh, with, an, uh, with a quick external fixator. Yeah. yeah. And, so and that the vascular then, repair can take place. And then get him back for a CT angio. Yeah. Yeah. Because this is time critical and that's also what we did. Uh, we go. Uh, go did not go to the angio suite. We went immediately to the operating theater. And that's what we found. <clears throat> we did a vascular repair. We did also a prophylactic fasciotomy of the entire leg because it's now about three hours after uh, the injury. <clears throat> we did some sort of a provisionally uh, condylar reconstruction and at some sort of a temporary fixation to the to the shaft. But uh, I agree uh, um, uh, to just to leave it where it is and bridge it with the X fix would be also a very valuable uh, valuable situation. But we shortened it for 18 centimeter and bridged it uh, the situation with. Um, uh, with uh, the external fixator. So, what problems do you expect? Sir, it may not be the best thing to shorten so much, sir. And dock it, uh, 18 centimeters is too too big uh, a distance for you to dock primarily. Yeah, if you, if, uh, if you don't uh, kink your vascular situation, we had to shorten it anyway for yeah. the vascular repair. There was some additional uh, leftovers, uh, but it was not kinked. So at any time after the reconstruction, um, uh, the perfusion, the peripheral perfusion was good. And I think uh, there are, there is literature uh, out saying you should not shorten more than what, well, I don't know, four centimeters or something. It's, it's very depending how free your vascular bundle is. Yeah. If you have so, a soft and fresh soft tissue and your fascia is open, you can shorten almost any amount. But if you are, have a tight compartment, then if you shorten, you're running in, into problems. And uh, therefore, mm, it's only partially true that you, you, you can only shorten uh, for a certain amount uh, of um, of centimeters, it depends on the um, tightness of the soft tissue around the vessel. So, wound closure yes. will be difficult. If yeah. you shorten too much, wound closure will be difficult. Yes, yes, you're right. So, what do we have problems do we expect? One is we we should not have any infection. Number yes. one. Yes, that's a big, yeah. big concern. First one. And second, Very big concern. get yeah. uh, 18 centimeters short, the limb. Yeah. So if there is no infection and uh, shortening, then probably you can always consider lengthening it to as much as possible yeah. to get the length back. Yeah. So there was no infection, I suppose. 
uh, there was in, uh, in a com uh, infection problem. And okay. this was not the only problem. We had the shortening. We have the, uh, I show you later, we get an infection. So, with uh, such a shortening and a vascular repair, lengthening, is it possible to lengthen then? Um, well, we, we come back to this later. Uh, I think, yeah. yes, yeah. we'll come back. Yes, but uh, the question is does it make sense? And how, how long does it take? And is it worthwhile? And uh, the other problem we had, we have, there was significant ligamentous instability. Okay. Okay. You saw this very short uh, distal of, uh, so we had ligament stability, we had shortening, we had uh, infection. You see here after nine weeks, relatively late, we had um, a positive sinogram. Okay. And that's how we mobilized him with this huge uh, walker. And after nine weeks, we had uh, this uh, infection problem. So the question to the faculty is, what should we do now? How severe was the infection? Oh, the vascular repair for lengthen is very difficult. Okay. In India, we do Elisa Elisra lengthening for the femur is little difficult. Yeah. So sometimes you can also do for the tibia. Yeah. It's a so uh, what what would you uh, with the infected knee now? Yeah. Would you consider lengthening of the femur or lengthening of femur? You cannot do much because yes. it's not easy to put a hybrid Elisra there also. Yeah. Sometimes we end up doing a lengthening of the tibia. Yeah. We do both femur and yeah. Knee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the knee is unstable and infected. That is difficult. That's that's a problem. So even if we grow the bone, which is technically possible, I absolutely agree, then we still have an unstable knee which is infected. What has happened to the tibia? Femur, sir, is it united according tibia, to you? Tibia is fine. No, no, femur, femur. Some, is, sorry? Femur, sir. Yeah, so, so, so femur is, um, you see the remaining bone. Okay. So soft tissues are uh, okay. It's closed, but we have one fistula. Can, well, can we remove the implant? The femur. Yeah. <laughs> Can we remove the implants and see if the infection subsides? Okay. But we would probably make need to make a thorough debridement, which would also additionally destabilize the unstable knee. So even when we uh, when we salvage the knee, it's unstable and it's. It's highly unstable, so it's 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 a problem. So what can we do, sir? Is there a non-union at the fracture site? It's nine weeks, so we we wouldn't expect it to be no, healed no. at nine weeks. Correct. Yeah, no, but we felt we need to make a, we need to make a decision, and. Uh, I would like to share with you what we do in these situations. Uh, we make a so-called, I call it decision matrix, where I, for myself and the team, and also later for the patient, I make a table with all the options and with all the, the, the factors like problem, I need it, expected complications and expected outcome and I uh, looked joint preserving and uh, lengthening everything is infected it's a knee level we have problem we have facing instability and arthritis it takes very long and we are very likely to uh, face uh, significant complications above knee amputation Certainly something we need to discuss with the patient, 
we have immediate we have an immediate solution, very quick, uh, low complications, but the expected function somehow limited um, for transfemoral amputation. Our thesis secondary lengthening also an option, but safe, but it takes takes time and no good function at the end. Arthrodesis and uh, leaving, leaving it shortened, no good function at all. Quick, quicker, but no good function. And then we spoke with the patient, the last point. Keep the good part and resect the bad part and take the tibia and do a rotation plasty. Healing is quickly, and we have some sort of a, a, a functional BK <laughs> rather than above knee amputation. And I, I, I show you how, how it went. Any comment so far? So fantastic. That's what we did. We uh, placed uh, the tibia to the femur, rotated it 180 degree and uh, provided him with uh, exoprosthesis. That's uh, eight, look at this here. That's an <laughs> eight year follow up. Not many patients have this. And that's how is, uh, we see him every second year and uh, we became friends now, that's him. <laughs> And he is a brave man. He is back to work in part time. He is some um, so sort of a craftsperson. And look at him. That's the video. Oh, yeah. That's the video when he's walking uphill. For every trans femoral amputee, uphill walking is a pain. But he is very confident, very safe and uh, a, a very active uh, patient. So we have his, um, his ankle is now since 18 years, his knee joint, and he is doing very, very well. He has very good uh, uh, knee scores, so-called knee scores. And um, this is uh, very, uh, some, uh, that are the uh, data, his, um, Walking energy, we measured all this. This is a very uh, similar to a below knee amputation, according to a paper from Huang, who looked at it, uh, oxygen uh, um, consumption, uh, BK yes. amputation, and um, uh, AK amputation. Yeah. Some so first, first case in the literature with a rotation plasty for trauma. It's well known for uh, tumor operation, but for trauma, it's the first case. And uh, patient uh, very happy. So um, long follow-ups and uh, it's something to con con consider. Yes, sir. Please comment. Fantastic, sir. Phenomenal. Excellent, excellent, sir. And uh, it's not the everyday case, but good to have it in mind, uh, yes. just in case. I, I was uh, op often thinking, uh, should we nowadays, what would happen if we, if we would have come today? We have better prosthesis, tumor prosthesis. But the nice thing for the rotation plasty, it's something definitive. Uh, Professor Kretek, uh, there are some questions. Would you mind taking them? Yes, of course. Please, go ahead. Just a moment, there are many, we will choose some. I think most questions are answered, sir. 
already good uh, uh, one question is uh, after putting the aloe graft when did you let the patient start to wait bare um is a general question not related yeah. to the cases not, not not related to this question yeah when we have aloe graft patients uh, usually after three months okay uh professor critic there is a there is another uh, demand from the audience yes uh the bangalore orthopedic society wants to hold a webinar its annual conference on 27th of march yes so they would like you to be uh, a faculty oh wonderful thank you uh, would you please fix up that date and note it up sir 20 march of 20 27 yeah okay yeah what uh, what it, day of the week is it it is a saturday yeah saturday saturday perfect good yeah we have confirmation from a lot of other faculty also so it is uh, from 10 to 4 and we will choose the best time that that suits you oh thank you and any topics of interest that you would are you are keen you could please let us know okay wonderful yeah, thank you very much we will very honored yeah but yeah, please confirm this uh, timing sir date yeah yeah right sir thank you very much and sir this is a hybrid conference this is a hybrid conference uh -huh. there'll be, okay there'll be virtual plus there'll be some 80 100 people is sitting in the hall oh wow so it will be a mixture of both big so big attendance thank you sir oh thank you thanks a lot sir thank yeah. you All yeah, Dr. Narendra, Dr. Narendra, to um, for what of thanks? Yeah, I uh, good evening, everyone, and good afternoon to our German faculty. I would like to thank uh, Bangalore Trauma Course for uh, allowing me for the proposal of what of thanks. I would like to thank Professor Kristen Kritik and uh, Professor uh, Christoph Justin. for their uh, enriched uh, knowledge sharing with us their experience we are greatly indebted i would like to thank the uh, moderator dr rajinayak and faculty dr rajendra dr uday kumar and uh, dr ajit and i would also like to thank dr satish ravegar and dr chandrashekar for uh, allowing the uh, us to organize this under the aegis of bangalore from a course and a bangalore orthopedic society and karnataka orthopedic society once once for all i would like to thank our uh, virtual professors and we would like to see them again thank you very much thank you thank you sir thank you very much thank you very much thank you sir fantastic fantastic cases thank you have a good weekend enjoy thank you thank you, thank you sir thank you. very good group i enjoyed thank you thank you thank you thank you very much sir good night